In this video I want to tell you about a paper that I wrote jointly with Giancarlo Azzurra in which we study symplectic embeddings of rational homology balls in certain algebraic surfaces. And I want to start by explaining why one might be led to consider the problem of symplectic embeddings of such things. And the motivation comes from algebraic geometry. So here's a difficult question given a smooth projective uh, surface over C. Um, what kinds of singularity can develop as you vary this projective surface? Let's give it a name X. So as X varies in its moduli space. In other words, if you deform X, maybe you, you know, maybe it's, it's embedded in some projective space, so you vary the equations, what kind of singularities can form? What's this got to do with symplectic geometry? Well, I'm going to actually fix a projective embedding. So this is sitting inside CPN for some n. And once you have that, you can pull back the Fabini to Decaler form from CPN to X. So X gets a symplectic structure or symplectic form from CPN. And the fantastic thing about this symplectic structure is that it doesn't really depend on X. If you vary the equations for X, the complex geometry of X can vary drastically just from point to point, but the symplectic structure doesn't really change. So, which is invariant under deformations. Right, when you deform X, you don't change the topology of X, nor do you change the symplectic structure. So, over the moduli space, here's, here's the picture of the moduli space. Different points in the moduli space correspond to varieties. Here's X. Here's some other X prime, another smooth guy in the same moduli space. There's a diffeomorphism from here to here called symplectic parallel transport, um, which identifies the symplectic form here with the symplectic form here. Okay, so how does this help? Well, let's suppose I have a singular variety somewhere in this moduli space. Some choice of the equations gives me a singularity. Well, I could try symplectically parallel transporting from here to the singular fibre. Now I run into some problems because the singular fibre doesn't even have to be diffeomorphic to either of these two guys. But away from the singularity Nonetheless, the topology looks the same. So let me just give you an example, in case this all seems a bit abstract. Let's suppose that x is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. x0 is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 0. And in between this moduli space is maybe some you know, just x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals epsilon. And as epsilon varies, the varieties vary. So you can imagine what this variety looks like. If you look at the real part, it's a sphere, radius 1. And then there's some compact piece, uh, non-compact, complex directions. Go off to infinity. Over here, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 0. That's some sort of nodal variety. It has a node at the origin. And what happens as you 
parallel transport from this smooth fibre to this singular fibre is this sphere, the real part, gets crushed down to this point. But el elsewhere, actually the sympathetic parallel transport does make sense. You can identify the points out here with the points out here. So there's some bad part called the vanishing cycle which gets crushed down to a point and then everything else gets mapped nicely into the into the smooth part of the singular fibre. So what is this red thing that I've drawn? This is what's called the link of the singularity. This is a contact type hypersurface. From the point of view of symplectic geometry, in other words, it's a particular kind of hypersurface that symplectic geometers care about. And we can find a copy of it in any of the smooth fibres of this vibration just by taking the link inside the singular fibre and parallel transporting it out to the other fibres. So if X develops a singularity of a certain type, in this case a nodal singularity, modelled on a particular um, model, then X itself, no matter where it is in the moduli space, contains a contact type hypersurface. modelled on the links, so a diffeomorphic to the link. In this example, what is the link? Well, it turns out to be it's diffeomorphic to RP3. So you, if you look at your smooth variety and you can't find, or you can prove there is no contact type RP3, well then you know it can't develop a nodal singularity. What's this got to do with the title symplectic embeddings? Well, the piece of X that is surrounded by this contact type hypersurface, the bit that collapses down to the singularity under parallel transport, is a symplectically embedded co-dimension zero submanifold. called the Milner fiber. And in, again for these um, in this particular example this is diffeomorphic to T star S2. So again if you can't find a symplectically embedded T star S2 then you can't develop a nodal singularity. So the specific kinds of singularities I'm going to be talking about, the ones that give you these rational homology balls, are called wall singularities, spelt W-A-H-L. No, and um, they have the following form. So you take C2, you quotient it by the action of the group Z mod P squared. P is just some number. <coughs> and how is this acting? Well, if we think about a, a root of unity, a P squared root of unity, mu, it's going to act in complex coordinates x, y as mu x and then mu to the P, Q minus 1, y. That's what that's describing this group action. Okay, so I'm going to quotient out by that group action. It's a particular kind of cyclic quotient singularity. This is a cyclic group. And they are singularities that have particular interest um, in singularity theory, basically because they have a smoothing 
whose Milner fiber has the rational homology, um, maybe I should say, whose Milner fiber it's called BPQ, right? There are two numbers, P and Q, in this definition, and it has the homology of BPQ over the rational numbers is just Q in degree zero and zero otherwise. Okay, so Q here is some number between uh, one and P, which is co prime to P. And you, so, you know, why this choice? Well, it turns out they're the only ones that have such a smoothing, which is a rational, this is called a rational homology ball, because it has the same rational homology as a ball. This makes them difficult to detect topologically, right? So in this example of a nodal singularity, you could hope to prove that there was no, uh, you, you could develop no nodal singularities purely homologically by proving that there's no homology class like this sphere, this green homology class. Right, it turns out this is a Lagrangian sphere. It has self-intersection minus two. If there are no minus two classes, spherical minus two classes in your four manifold, you can't develop a nodal singularity. This, there's basically no homological data, right? The rational homology is trivial. So it becomes much harder to rule these guys out. So what is the link actually while we're at it? In this case, it's pretty much by definition, the lens space L P squared PQ minus one, which is defined as the quotient of S3 by the same group action. So here's an example of a theorem that you can prove using these ideas due to me and Ivan Smith. Um, so let X be a surface of general type. B plus bigger than one, and suppose that you give it a symplectic structure, which is in the canonical class. In other words, minus the first chain class. Um, then if there's a symplectic embedding of a BPQ in X. Then, well, we can basically put a bound on P just in terms of the churn numbers of X. So the, let's say the length of PQ, which is the length of the continued fraction P squared over PQ minus one, where I write it as a continued fraction with negative signs like this. And then the length of that continued fraction is bounded above by four KX squared plus seven. So that gives you a bound on the, um, the kinds of rational homology balls you can embed, gives you a bound on the kinds of wall singularities you can develop uh, for a surface of general type. Um, so this is not quite sharp, but let me just give you an indication of what was formerly known about this. So in the 1990s, Young Nam Lee gave uh, the bound that this is less than 400 kx squared to the fourth. So this is quite a lot smaller than that bound. Um, and actually, 
the same time as us, uh, Julie Rana and Giancarlo Atsua, showed that, okay, none of this symplectic nonsense, but, you know, if you work in the algebraic world, then um, the length of a wall singularity on a stable surface um, is bounded over by 4k squared plus 1, and this is sharp. So I don't actually know if you can improve this to 4k squared plus 1. I didn't really think about it. Um, but the um, this is a symplectic result, right? So this proof is symplectic, the consequence is uh, symplectic, and you also get this nice algebraic corollary. So I want to contrast this with the observations of many topologists thinking about these sorts of things. So let me name some of them here. So Khodorovsky, who who actually has so preliminary results in this direction too. Uh, so Khodorovsky, Brendan Owens, Park, Park, Shin, and probably other people um, have results that actually go in the opposite direction to this. So they find unbounded P's smoothly embedded inside various four manifolds. So they find sequences of BPQs smoothly embedded. Right, because BPQ is a smooth four manifold, you can just try and smoothly embed it without any of the symplectic structure. Um, and you can find such sequences with, with p going off to infinity, which is a contrast to this result. So Giancarlo and I were trying to understand these results from the point of view of symplectic geometry and, and algebraic geometry. And, um, and that's what I want to tell you about now. So let me get a new page. Um, so here's what we can prove. Just an example of what we can prove. The really the proof is more interesting than the statement. But let X be a quintic surface. There are loads of other examples too. We give another one in the paper. A Godot surface. Um, then there exists a symplectic form on X, not in the canonical class. Um, for which there are symplectic embeddings B, P, Q in X for so P and Q are to begin with 5, 3 and you can also get 14, 9 and uh, 37, 24, 97, 63, etc. And there's an unbounded sequence. So the point is this this sequence, uh, both of these sequences satisfy a recursion formula, which is that uh, pi plus 2 equals delta pi plus 1 minus pi. And the same, exactly the same guy for q, where delta is 3. Okay, so you can just keep going and generate this infinite sequence of, of symplectically embedded bulls. And the key point, the reason this is not a contradiction to the previous theorem, is that this symplectic form for which these are symplectically embedded is not in the canonical class. Right, the quintic surface is a general type surface, but we're not using the canonical polarization. So this sequence, this uh, recurrence relation, they're called Mori sequences. And maybe later I can try and explain what the link to Mori theory is. So this is uh, Evans Ertua in our paper on anti-flips and other things. So what is the idea behind this proof? 
as I say, the, the idea is more interesting than the specific statement, right? Because this is just a particular example. But the idea is um, start with some kind of a orbifold. So this is a picture of an orbifold, like uh, right. So there's two orbifold points here and here. There's a curve P1 connecting these two orbifold points. Um, and let's suppose these orbifold points are wall singularities, so they're cyclic quotient singularities. Here and here. So when you smooth this orbifold, what you get is, this is all the sort of cartoon, I'll make it slightly more precise later. Um, when you smooth this orbifold, um, you know, this wall singularity gets replaced by a copy of the Milner fiber. So BPQ. Same over here. And so this is now some smooth manifold. And I claim that we can find this non-compact smooth manifold sitting as an open set in in a quintic surface for particular values of p and q. What we then need to do is some kind of operation called an anti-flip which changes the symplectic form. All right, so the point is you can actually find this guy symplectically embedded in a quintic with its canonical polarization. But if you anti-flip, you change the symplectic structure then that operation, what does that operation do? It gives you another subset that looks kind of the same, but the the b's, the p's and the q's are different. So this one is now b p one q one, whereas the one that used to be over there is now over here, and this is a new one called b p two q two. I'll explain how to do this exactly in a second. This is all just a sort of cartoon level. And now it turns out once you've done this, uh, you can continue doing something called a mutation. And the mutation has the effect of changing. It moves this BPQ over here. And gives you a new BPQ over here, and then you can keep doing this, and that's what gives you your Mori sequence. And what is this? This doesn't change. So, what is a mutation? It doesn't change the symplectic structure. It doesn't change the manifold. It all it's really doing is changing the picture that we draw of the manifold. So what's really going on here is each of these pictures is somehow a, a picture of a Lagrangian torus vibration, um, also known as an almost toric vibration. Um, and I, at this stage, all we're doing is changing the vibration so that it somehow highlights different parts of the geometry and we suddenly see all those parts of the geometry. OK, so that's vaguely how how we go about doing this and you know the proof will work whenever you can find a symplectically embedded thing that looks like this which works whenever you find your variety as a smoothing of one of these um, orbifolds with a p1 and two wall singularities so let me get a new page and explain really what's going on so in each case the picture on the previous page um, was supposed to be was supposed to indicate an almost toric vibration. On some open manifold. which is just an open subset of 
of the Quintic. So I want to tell you what an almost toric vibration is. I want to tell you exactly what kinds of picture you need to draw in order to reconstruct a symplectic manifold and then hopefully things will start to make sense. So um, an almost toric vibration on a symplectic four manifold is a map, a smooth map So let's call the smooth four manifold X. So it's a map to some two-dimensional base um, whose fibers are Lagrangian tori, or whose uh, let's say regular fibers are Lagrangian tori. Um, in fact, I don't, need, don't even need to specify that they're tori. The fact that they're Lagrangian implies that they are tori by the arnold Liouville theorem. Um, and we also need to impose some uh, restrictions on the singular fibers. So the singular fibers are points, circles, or pinched tori. Pinch toruses in this. It's a torus with a circle collapsed. Um, okay, so the, the proper definition is slightly more complicated um, than this, but let me start just talking about Lagrangian torus vibration with no singular fibers. So if you have no singular fibers, then it turns out the base inherits a structure called an integral affine structure. So let's say the regular locus in B inherits a integral affine structure. What does that mean? Well, here's one of my torus fibers. Here's a nearby torus fiber by the Weinstein neighborhood theorem, I can write a neighborhood of this guy as the cotangent bundle of the torus, and sufficiently close to this torus, the other fibers will look like the graphs of closed one forms. So this guy is relative to the other guy, a graph of some one form eta such that d eta is zero. That means that the nearby fibers, you know, correspond to cohomology classes on the torus. So in other words, there's a map from B, a locally defined map from B to the first cohomology of T2 with coefficients in R, which just takes this fiber um, that in local model is, is the graph of a closed one form, to uh, the cohomology class of eta. Okay, so you have a locally defined map from the base of your, the regular locus of the base of your torus vibration to the cohomology of the torus, which is a vector space, right? It's R2. And it has this canonical integer lattice of integral cohomology sitting inside it. And there's various choices that need to be made when you write down this map, right, you need to be able to identify the fiber with a torus, for example. Um, and those choices will lead to different maps, but those maps are going to be related by integral affine transformations of the cohomology. So this is an extra structure that you get on the base of a Lagrangian torus vibration. And it turns out that you know given an integral affine manifold so something which is locally modeled on 
you know, a subset of R2 and the gluing maps are integral affine linear maps. Um, we can reconstruct the total space of the torus vibration up to simple automorphism. So if somebody specifies for you an integral affine manifold, you can give them back canonically up to simple automorphism the space of which that was the base of Lagrangian torus vibration. You know, there's some caveats in that one, so that's not quite true. Um, but at least if the base is contractible, that's true. Um, you also have to be slightly careful about these singularities. Um, so I'm not going to worry too much about them, but you need to be careful about how the integral affine structure looks near the singular fibers. Um, but this is true enough for what I want to say today. So the point is that I can draw a picture. The, the point is a picture is going to give us an integral affine manifold surface. And that's going to allow us to reconstruct a four manifold. So if I zoom back in time, each of these pictures is, currently doesn't describe anything, but when I give it some extra decorations, it will describe for me a four manifold symplectic four manifold uniquely up to symplectomorphism. So here, here's the um, the really important example. Here's a picture of BPQ. So this is a picture which is going to specify for me the space BPQ. What is the picture? It's a wedge inside the plane. So you should imagine that this this is all shaded in and and then we, we take this subset of the plane. Um, I cut that subset of the plane along this line. Okay. Um, or I should tell you which subset it is, right? This vector here that points in this direction is the vector p squared pq minus one. This one is just a vertical vector. Uh, so I'm going to cut this wedge in the direction pq for some distance and then what I get is a subset of the plane so it canonically has an integral affine structure the plane is just a copy of R2 so it has it's identified with R2 so this I'm going to tweak the integral affine structure by re-gluing the two sides of this branch cut so I'm going to identify points here with points here, and I'm going to twist the uh, integral affine structure by some matrix A. And that matrix A is going to be the unique matrix which sends this vector here, this vertical vector, to this vector. The one pointing in this direction, pointing backwards. So that with respect to this new twisted integral affine structure, this thing is a straight line. It looks broken, it's actually straight. So what is the matrix A? Um, it's going to be, I think, 1 plus PQ minus P squared minus q squared 1 minus pq. Okay, so in other words, if I have a tangent vector over here above the cut and I move it over the cut, it gets hit by this matrix. Let's just check. If I apply this to the vector 0, 1, what I get is minus p squared 1 minus pq, which is minus this vector. So really this red line is a straight line in, in this new twisted affine structure. 
Okay, what is this X that I've drawn here? Well, this is one of these pinched fibers. This uh, this kind of fiber of my vibration. The thing is, whenever I want to do this, twisting the uh, the monodromy, uh, twisting the affine structure by some monodromy matrix, I'm going to need to introduce a a pinched torus fiber here. So the fiber over this point is a pinched torus. Okay, the fibers over the interior of the wedge are ordinary tori. The fibers over the edge are all circles. Just like in toric geometry, if you've seen toric geometry. So you should think of this as like a toric picture of a, a toric manifold, except it's got this singular fiber and this weird twisting of the affine structure. So, zooming back up to my pictures from before, when I've put this kind of um, semicircle or whatever fragment of a circle, uh, segment of a circle here, what I should have drawn really is a little X and a little branch cut. And you can't read it off the picture that I've drawn because it's too approximate, but really the directions of these arrows and this branch cut really matter like this edge and this edge and this branch could all have rational slope and the rational slopes matter because they tell you about the topology of this Milner fiber and the same thing over here so there are going to be more of these branch cuts and, and these singular fibers in all of these pictures so what I want to do first is to tell you about this part of the story, mutation. So what is mutation, when can you do it, and how does it give you this infinite sequence of these BPQs? Well, I've told you that from a picture you get an integral affine surface, but actually going back the other way to get from an integral affine surface to a picture uh, requires some choices to be made and different pictures can give you the same integral affine surface so here is an example of that um, let's take this picture of BPQ and let's cut it in half uh, I need another color maybe pink cut it in half along the branch cut. So let's keep cutting the branch cut through the X and all the way up. And let's call the two halves P and Q. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep P not change anything and I'm going to take Q and I'm going to apply A to it. Is that right or A inverse? Let's think. I basically want this line here to be going downwards, so I think I want A inverse. Uh, so this is going to be A inverse Q. Right, so I've just said what I want. This vector here, if I apply A inverse, you can check to P squared PQ minus 1, it ends up pointing directly downwards. And so now I'm just going to take the whole right half plane. Uh, the X is still going to be here, but now the branch cut is going to go up along the pink one. I claim this picture, this diagram, gives me the same integral affine manifold as the one above. And basically all you've done is change the branch cut from pointing one way along the pink line to pointing the other way along the pink line. You kind of swung the branch cut around. That's because you know when you draw these pictures you have to make a choice of direction of the branch cut. And you can change that choice. You get a different picture. And you can see in this picture below this thing that looked like a bent line, this red line here, is really a straight line. It just goes down like that. So we're focusing in on you know the affine structure in a different way so that it's no longer cut by the branch cut it's just a straight line here okay 
it's a, this is the same integral affine manifold. Which means, in particular, it defines the same full manifold. But the pictures look very different. So this is called a mutation. The first place I came across this is in the work of Galkin and Rosnich on cluster varieties and Laurent phenomenon. So it's quite a well-known operation in uh, in the theory of polytopes and cluster varieties. So let's apply this operation to a picture like this one, or, or, or this one, here. Okay, I probably need a new page. So here is a particular four manifold. I'm going to mutate, say, along this branch cut. And let me just redraw it so it's more clear what's going on. I'm going to assume that this branch cut is pointing in such a way that if you continue it, it's going to hit this other edge. Okay, It doesn't have to do that in order to do mutation. You can do mutation whatever happens. But if it hits that other edge, then the resulting guy is going to look similar to the thing you started with. So let's mutate. So let we keep the top half of the picture fixed. We apply the affine monogamy to the bottom half of the picture. Um, that means th this bottom edge is going to end up pointing down in the same direction as the left hand edge. This segment, oh, I stop saying this, and let me do the colors, right? So the bottom red edge is going to end up pointing downwards like that. The blue edge here is going to end up connecting this red point here to wherever we did the cut. So here I'm applying oops, A inverse, whatever A is for this monotony matrix here. And I get a new, new uh, polygon which has a vertex here and a vertex here. This branch cut here that was giving us our B, P, uh, 2, Q2 is now mapped over here somewhere. So B, P2, Q2 ends up living over here. What's going on at this corner up here? Well, the branch cut is now pointing in this direction and this whole thing is a new B3, uh, P3, Q3. Right, so the thing we started with had a B, P1, Q1 over here and the new thing has got a B, P3, Q3 over here. P's, the Q's, depend on the rational slopes involved in the diagram. You can really figure them out, right? If you if you know exactly what all the rational slopes of all these edges are, you know what this matrix is, you can really figure out what the rational slopes are afterwards, so you can figure out what the P's and the Q's are. That's where the Mori sequence uh, recursion relation comes from. And now you can try and play the same game, right? So you can extend this branch cut and hope that it's going to hit this other edge in this picture. Unfortunately, the way I've drawn it, it doesn't. Um, but you could imagine that if you if you um, if you uh, rub things out and redraw it, let me draw the pink line first. You know, 
if you're lucky then the new branch cut here will again hit this edge and you can continue to mutate and if you're really lucky you can do it infinitely often well you don't have to be that lucky actually it happens almost always that you can continue mutating and that's where this infinite Mori sequence comes from uh, so that explains this part of the picture we start with some particular sympathetic manifold we change the picture we don't change the manifold and in the new picture of the same manifold we can see more interesting uh, BPQs we do actually have to change the vibration a little bit because if we want to continue mutating like this we're gonna have to move this branch cut out of the way kind of zoom it along until it gets very close to this corner you can do that that's an operation called nodal sliding so all of this I should say all of these um, these pictures were invented by Margaret Symington in the 90s uh, as a way of you know, manipulating sympathetic four manifolds in particular this philosophy of going from a picture to a four manifold is really from her work what do we still need to do I've explained this part of the picture I need to explain how to go from the particular configuration that we start with in the quintic which I'll tell you in a minute to something that we can mutate so the point is that whatever we find inside the quintic we can't mutate we know that by uh, this boundedness theorem if we were able to mutate stuff in the quintic then you know for the canonical sympathetic form then we'd be able to find infinitely many of these BPQs with higher and higher P's we know that can't happen so something happens to has to happen first and that thing is called an anti-flip so let me give you the specific diagram that we need for the, the quintic okay so here we have our almost toric vibration Um, this vector here has slope 11 over 3 no 3 3 over 11 right. the vector 11 3 and this one is the vector 4 1 and this is just vertical um, this guy is a wall so the, the BPQ here is um, a B2 1 which for those who are interested is the same as T star RP2 topologically and sympathetically here actually it's B11 so it doesn't really matter that you've got this here there's no this is just a ball there's no real BPQ here it's just a ball so I don't even need to make a branch cut here because this is just an ordinary toric vibration I can in here and the problem with this is if you extend this line this line that is pointing in the 2 1 direction you're never going to hit this edge because this has slope a half this has slope 3 11 which is smaller than a half so this is not mutable I'm not going to explain how you embed this thing in a quintic just now maybe later um, but I am going to explain how you fix this non-mutability so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to mutate uh, mutate along this guy here what happens this edge ends up pointing straight down this edge ends up pointing somewhere maybe over here and you can see the result looks nothing like the thing we started with so the thing we started with looked like uh, this the thing we ended with looks like this and I probably need 
need a bit more space don't I let me get another page so here's where we're at by mutation we've obtained this picture and this is our, our B21 except apologies the branch cut is no longer pointing in this direction the branch cut is now pointing in this direction I told you a picture like this determines for you a symplectic manifold so I'm going to draw you a sequence of pictures and that's going to determine a sequence of symplectic manifolds Right, what I'm doing is I'm taking this uh, this branch cut and I'm just translating it down okay so that I'm just drawing a, a sequence of times in that that's a sequence of pictures so a sequence of pictures like this gives a sequence of symplectic four manifolds but the difference now is they're not all symplectomorphic so the cohomology class of omega is changing in fact it starts off uh, non-exact there's some so if, if you look on the previous page, this guy here has non-zero area and you can cap it off with the Lagrangian disk over here that has zero area. There's some closed cycle that has non-zero area. At some point in this deformation, the symplectic form becomes exact and then it goes through being exact and comes out on the other side. And so you're changing omega quite drastically you're not changing the topology at all right literally nothing changes apart from the symplectic form afterwards um, let's again get rid of all this sort of intermediate stuff and so after you've done that this B21 disappears and if you mutate back then your branch cut ends up pointing this way and this edge ends up pointing over here somewhere oh I should make it straight and again we we end up with something that looks more like what we started with so we started with something like this we mutated and got something like that and now after all of this we've ended up with something that looks like this it's got three edges one compact non two non-compact and you can see here this is it turns out if you do the the arithmetic it turns out to be a B five three over here we still have our b uh, one one the ball um, but we've introduced this b five three so what you can do now it turns out is you can mutate from over here so now this thing is mutable you can start mutating from here and you get this uh, this mori sequence so this is now mutable. So I think for me the most interesting question that remains is how far do you have to change omega before this theorem, this uh, theorem on boundedness, fails? So we can prove boundedness for the canonical class we can prove there are 
cohomology classes that are actually quite far away from the canonical class that have unbounded symplectically embedded rational homology balls but in between what happens is it as soon as you go away from the canonical class you can find infinite sequences or do you have to actually go some definite distance away um, so for this construction to work there's a definite sort of integer affine distance away from the canonical class you have to go but in general I, I don't know so I still haven't told you what this has to do with the quintic surface so how do you actually find um, this subset or which which subset this subset inside a quintic surface uh, let me just finish by telling you that because um, nothing I've said so far depends on X being a quintic so how to find this guy in a quintic as, a, as an open set in a quintic surface well the idea is degenerate the quintic until it develops a singularity roughly speaking I just mean crush this bit to a point right so there's an orbifold or a singular variety that you get toric variety in fact with this as its moment, moment polytope where this is now a singular point a singular point modeled on like c2 over z mod 2 so I want to find this configuration in a singular quintic and then when I smooth it I'm gonna get this guy in the nearby smooth quintic so here is a construction you start with p1 times p1 s2 times s2 um, inside this you take a curve b of by degree 6 6 by degree in other words a curve in the homology class 6 times this guy plus 6 times this guy uh, with certain properties so you want B to intersect the diagonal at six points with multiplicity 2 so tangentially non-transversely and you want B to intersect uh, say s2 times a point at three points again tangentially and then you're going to take the double cover branched over B that gives you some surface uh, which is a smooth surface called a Horikawa surface And the nice thing is this surface contains the following configuration of curves. It can contain a minus 4 curve, a sphere with self-intersection minus 4, and a sphere with self-intersection minus 3 that intersect transversely at one point. What are those two curves? They're the pre-image of, you know, so the pre-image of the diagonal is now two components, two spherical components that intersect at six points. Each of those components is a minus 4 curve and the pre-image of this ruling s2 times a point is going to be a pair of minus 3 curves that intersect each other at 3 points and the diagonal and the ruling intersect at 1 point right the diagonal is like this the ruling is like this they intersect at 1 point their pre-images intersect transversely um, so it's, if you just pick one component in each of those two pre-images you get this configuration and now if you contract this minus 4 curve uh, then 
using ideas of Rana, you can prove that the result can be smoothed to give you a, a quintic surface. So that when you contract this minus four curve, you get exactly this kind of singularity. So you have a singular surface and you can prove that it's smoothable and that the smoothing is a quintic surface. So that is how you construct this subset in the quintic.